What's up guys, welcome back to the channel and today we're going to be covering a highly requested topic on tuning and that is gearing. I plan on doing a mini series of sorts on the different settings in the tuning sheet but I wanted to start with gearing because I think it's arguably the most important thing to get right and it's also the least understood. But before we get started, if you are interested in videos like these and you find them helpful, please like the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. This video took a lot of time to make so I want to make sure this is what everybody's looking for. Now I apologize in advance if any of this content feels like a college lecture or if it's boring to you, but I feel like it's necessary to really explain gearing in depth so all questions will be answered. But as always, if you do have questions on this after the video, put them in the comments. But without further ado, let's dive in. So first, what's the purpose of a transmission in gears? The transmission is what allows power to transmit, as the name suggests, from the engine to the wheels, and gears allow the engine to stay at its desired operating speed to maximize efficiency whether that means fuel economy or, in our case, power. Adjustable gear ratios allow us to keep the engine in its peak power band for as long as possible, and that's exactly what we'll be doing when we're tuning the gears in Gran Turismo 7. Now, what do all these numbers mean? These are your gear ratios, and these dictate how large the gear is. The values themselves represent how fast the engine spins in relation to how fast the gear spins. So for example, the engine spins 2.907 RPM for every RPM of first gear, and then it spins 2.088 RPM for every or one RPM of second gear, etc. The takeaway here is that the lower the number, the faster speed that gear can reach, so it makes sense that the higher gears have lower numbers. You can also see this visually on the gear chart as you move the values around. You can see it gets shorter as the number goes up, and it gets longer as the number goes down. So now we're just going to reset our gearbox back to default. Also, I could go into how torque multiplication works with gear ratios, uh, but I think that's outside of the scope of understanding them for the game. But if you're interested in the physics behind that, there are plenty of resources out there readily available. Also, final drive is a bit unique because this is the last set of gears between the transmission and the drive wheels. So this comes in handy more so when you don't have fully adjustable gear ratios because you can change your top end. You can't Individually adjust gears with those sport boxes, but you can use a final drive ratio to achieve a more desirable gearbox. But when you have a fully customizable gearbox like this, it's just another knob to turn that will get you to the same place with different numbers. You can achieve the same engine speed in a particular gear by simultaneously lengthening the gear and shortening the final drive or vice versa. One frequent problem I've seen a lot of people mention is that their gears don't always save. So I'd like to explain that too. Your gearbox cannot have a gear with a higher ratio than a gear that is sequentially below it. For example, first gear is 2.907, so second gear's ratio must be lower than 2.907. The game also has a built-in boundary for each gear that makes it so you can't put gears too close together. So if you try to exceed those boundaries, that's where you'll run into this problem. For example, I'm gonna try to set my third gear on top of or even behind second gear. And as you can see here, it starts to move second gear by itself. And this might throw off your desired ratios as second gear was already where you wanted it. Likewise, if we wanted to move third gear on top of or past fourth gear, so we now have it at 1.318, when we back out and go back in, it now set us back to 1.364. So it also limits how long we can go with these gears. So if we wanted to go any longer with third gear, we'd have to lengthen fourth gear first. So to avoid running into these boundaries, go from the last gear down to the first gear when setting your numbers if you're making the gears longer, and go from first to last if you're making them shorter. Now that we understand the gear numbers, we need to understand how to use them. The numerical values themselves aren't super important, but we need to know where to put the numbers for any given car. To do that, we need to look at the power curve. In short, we're going to be using the transmission to keep the engine at an RPM where it makes the most horsepower for as long as possible. This results in the most torque at the wheels, regardless of how much engine torque there is, and the more torque that is applied to the wheels, the faster the car will accelerate. For those who want to understand this concept in more detail and to differentiate between peak engine torque and peak engine power for acceleration, I've left a couple of great videos in the description explaining this, so go check those out if you have the time. With this concept in mind, how do we apply it? As an example, 
we're going to be using this Volkswagen GTI VGT. This car is perfect for this because of its unique power band, especially at higher RPM. Now to see a car's power band, you can look at the ECU or the power restrictor in the tuning sheet. To find peak power for any car, just view it in your garage or in Brand Central like so, and you'll find the RPM at which peak power and torque are made. Now, you can see on this GTI that the peak power isn't quite at redline. And that's very important to note because if you rev out higher than this peak, and if you rev the engine as long as possible before every shift, you're actually losing power. So what I like to do is identify an RPM band around peak power where I'd like to stay, and then I set the gears so I stay in that band. Usually I'll try to keep this band anywhere between 1000 and 1500 RPM wide to start with. Unfortunately, there's no grid or anything in the game so you can see exactly what RPM values you're dealing with, so you kind of have to eyeball it to get an idea. These lines on the screen are where I'd like to keep the engine RPM. I don't want to go below the left line because the power drops too much. I don't want to go past the right line and actually lose more power. And I also don't want these lines too close together because that will result in very short gears and you being very busy with shifting. Also, note that I prefer to have the left line further from the peak than the right line because power drops off quicker to the right of the peak. So I want to stay out of that region if possible. The main takeaway here is that you want to stay around your peak power as long as possible, regardless of what engine RPM it occurs. Now to reinforce this concept of staying in the power band, we're gonna look at a baseline lap with correct shifting points, then I'll show a lap where I shift as late as possible against the first lap's ghost. So now we're coming across the line and you can see I'm short shifting this car quite a bit. I'm shifting right around 6,500 RPM because that's where the stats said peak power was. Also, you can see when I'm shifting, all of those gears are pretty close together. So in this particular car, some of these gears are under a thousand RPM apart between shift points. And typically the rule of thumb is the, the more isolated the peak is on your power curve, the closer you want your gears to be so you can stay closer to that peak. But if you have a wide power band, like some of the cars I built uh, for the first daily race B on Deep Forest Raceway, you can get away with some pretty wide gear ratios. Nothing crazy, but definitely wider than on this car. If you want to see an example of that, I'll leave a link to my one of my videos in the description below so you can see what I'm talking about. Also, I'm sure you noticed that I'm in cockpit cam for this replay when I'm normally in chase cam for gameplay. And I'm doing that because this actually shows you what RPM you're at. You can also choose to go into bumper cam because this actually gives you analog gauges which help you tune gears with even more accuracy. I'll usually use one of these two cameras to tune my gears but unfortunately, these two cameras are the only way to obtain this information. So you'll have to switch to these and drive with them for a bit if you use a different camera. I wish the analog gauges were an option in chase cam, but I digress. But now we're just coming across the line and now that we finish this lap, we can run a lap where we rev it out all the way and see how it compares. We're just coming out of the last corner on the second lap, and as you can see, we're really revving it out. And yes, I'm in chase cam because that's how we have to compare ghosts here, but as you can see, the first ghost is pulling away even though I'm full throttle. As we come into this corner, I actually beat the ghost through the corner, and I'm right on its bumper as we exit, and we're about even coming through here. But as soon as I hit that shift to fourth gear, revving it out too long, the ghost starts to pull away again. So this really emphasizes how important it is to keep the car in the power van for as long as possible and your gear ratios will help you achieve that. And yet again, we see a corner where we gain time, and you'll see at the end of this lap, even though it's an overall better lap in terms of cornering, we lose almost a half a second just from shifting incorrectly. So it's really important to identify where your power band is so you can avoid time losses like these. Now that's an example of what it looks like to be past the right line I drew earlier on the power curve. But what does it look like when we're below the left line? To demonstrate that, we're going to make fourth gear even longer and move the rest of the higher gears up accordingly. Then we'll shift at the same point from third to fourth gear, and we'll see how much time we lose from being farther away from peak power. As you can see here, when we shift to fourth gear, the ghost pulls away just like when we shifted too late, although it's not quite as bad here. This goes back to how I mentioned the power curve dropping off faster after the peak than before it in this car. This trend will vary from car to car, so that's where checking the power curve comes into play. But the same principle as the previous case applies, but this time we're just outside the lines on the left instead of the right. The important part here is that we're farther away from peak power in both cases. Now if you see something like this happening, then the gear you shifted to needs to be made shorter. 
Likewise, if we had a fourth gear that was too short, we'd end up in the region to the right of the lines, which we already established as suboptimal, and we'd lose time not only from power loss, but also from having to shift to fifth gear even earlier. Each upshift does cost you a bit of time, so make sure to balance out your power band and gear spacing appropriately. Now that we've seen the importance of staying in the power band, we can fine tune our gears accordingly. That will mostly come from trial and error. While you can use the gear speed shown on the gearbox chart, running the car on the track and making changes on the fly is the best way to really dial in your gears for optimal power. One other thing you might have heard in this regard is that you should set your longest gear so that it almost hits red line on the longest straight on the track. While this is true for cars with peak power near red line, remember what we just saw on these laps and think about what would happen in this car. Here we would apply similar logic and make the final gear long enough for the longest straight so that we reach or just barely exceed the RPM where we get peak power, not make it go to red line. But with all this in mind, I think we have a pretty good base understanding of what we want our gears to look like. But that's not all there is to it. While we have to set our gears to achieve optimal power, we also have to make sure that each corner on the track has an optimal gear, which is arguably more important than perfecting straight line gearing. Because if you exit a corner with low power, that'll ruin the entire approach to the next sector of the track. A quick rule of thumb to start with here is to set the lowest gear, usually second in most cars, to where it works well in the slowest corner on the track, then set the highest gear at the end of the straight as we described before, and then space out the remaining gears evenly. However, this won't work right out of the box in most cases, and we need to be able to figure out how to adjust gears for a corner. So, let's find out what it looks like when a gear is either too long or too short for a corner. The stock gears for this car are actually pretty decent for the corners on this track, so we'll use that same baseline lap again to see how much time we lose out of the first corner with a suboptimal gear. So we're going to take a look at the long gear set first. Now what I've done here is I've extended every gear by 30 kilometers an hour on the gear speeds, or roughly 18-19 miles an hour. So what this is going to do is this is going to make third gear too long for the first corner, and we're going to see what that looks like on an actual lap when comparing it to a ghost with a good third gear. Now because the gears are all at a higher speed, but they're spaced the same, you'll see as we cross the line, we're hitting a very similar top speed as the original Ghost. When we hit the brakes at the same point, we actually get a tiny bit better run through this corner. We were able to throttle earlier. You can see we're so low in the RPM that we're just not making enough power, and the Ghost just pulls away because it's a lot closer to peak power out of the corner. So we have two options there. We can either use second gear, or we can make third gear shorter. Now. What happens if you make third gear too short? Now this is a gearbox that has been shifted 30 kph or 18, 19 miles an hour in the other direction. So again, the same gear spacing, but now our third gear is much shorter than the original baseline gearbox. So we're coming across the line again, same thing as last time. The gear spacing is similar, just a gear up because it's so short, but similar top ends. We come into the corner very similarly, and watch what happens here. Since I'm at a higher RPM closer to peak power, I actually get a better exit here, but then I immediately have to shift. And not only am I getting wheel spin from that gear being so short and it being difficult to put down power, but I also have to shift up immediately after and end up in a lower part of the power band. So even though my horsepower was higher on the initial exit, if you took the average power down that small straightaway, the original Ghost would be making more average power, which is why it accelerated quicker. And now that begs the question, how long is too long and how short is too short? Again, this is more of a trial and error exercise than anything. You might end up doing exactly what I'm doing here and comparing to a Ghost to figure out what works best. At least that's what I do when I tune gears. But as far as the physics go, when you're turning the car, a portion of the tire's available grip is used for cornering, so that means there's less available grip remaining to put down power. So you might be making too much power to put down in the first place. The silver lining to this is that you can set your gear ratios so that you're putting down just enough power for the tires to handle without losing traction as you exit the corner, given the amount of throttle control that suits your driving style. And by the time you exit the corner and have all grip available again for putting down power since the wheels are straight, you'll be at or close to peak power again. Gears can be up to preference to a certain degree when thinking of it this way, but there will always be limits to how far you can stray from what would be considered optimal, so just be careful with how much you try to play with that. 
With these examples in mind, hopefully I've armed you guys with the knowledge to tune your own gears in GT7. I can only teach you all so much, so the rest is up to you guys to do. So you guys need to go out on track and test some of these principles I've laid out and see how they apply when you're actually in the car. But that's going to wrap things up for today everyone. Again, this took a long time to make so please show some love and like the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. For all of you that requested this, please let me know if this helped you. And if you have any questions or comments about the information I went over today, please put those in the comments below. Also, I want to know, what tuning settings do you guys want me to go over next? So, if you have any preferences on that, let me know those in the comments as well. But that's all I've got for this one, so I hope you enjoyed, and I will see you next time. Thanks.